So welcome back. Uh, we're continuing here with a series of conversations today. Now we'll uh, hold the conversation in English. Uh, Olivier uh, is uh, the director of uh, Galerie Yvon Lambert from Paris. Um, and uh, the idea, of course, once again, for those who are not here, the idea in, in, uh, of these series of dialogues is to uh, establish dialogues and conversations with the three sort of principal agents that the fair deals with. The galleries, the galleries to the dinner today, tomorrow we'll have three different curators, and on Saturday we'll have three different collectors, no? The idea, this is of course part of the new educational program that Fernanda Feitosa has invited me to work with her, uh, this and the curatorial lab on the other side. Um, the, uh, the discussions are being recorded, Foro Permanente is actually broadcasting them, and we will compile this uh, over the next few years in the hopes of putting together a book on these three uh, different agents, the, the practices of these three different uh, agents, the galleries, the collectors, and the curators. So I want to thank you, uh, uh, Olivier, for coming, and uh, Pedro Menges is here to help me with the conversation. Pedro Menges is the director, founder, uh, owner, <laughs> Uh, uh, one of the uh, directors and founders of Menges Wood, the Sao Paulo gallery here that has been operational since 2010 here in Sao Paulo. No? So, Olivier, um, I want to ask you to start by telling us a little bit about the uh, beginning of the gallery in, the, in 1966 no? with uh, Yvonne Lambert in so Paris. Basically, the story of Yvonne is a little bit weird because he, he started collecting at the age of 14. He was, he has bought a painting that he kept. It was from a local artist because Yvonne grew up in the south of France in a region called Vence and where Matisse has been very well known and, and made this very famous church. And basically Yvonne's parents, his father was a taxi driver. His mother was a grocery woman. She has a shop, basically. So he doesn't come from a wealthy family, but he knows from the very beginning that he wanted to be related to art. So when his parents told him at the age of 16, when he quits school, what he wants to do, he said, I want to open a gallery. And it come out of the blue or not necessarily as, as blue, but you know, he didn't go to the museum that often, but maybe the story is that his father used to be the taxi driver for Matisse. <laughs> so maybe that's maybe the connection, but we are not very sure if it's where it comes from. But then, Yvonne start to open a little gallery in Vence with a secondary market, and then after a year, he has decided to move to Paris and open his first gallery in 1966. The greatest thing is that he was next to Ileana Sonabund, who was the wife of prestigious Leo Castelli, gallerist. And Ileana, she was dealing with pop art. She had Liechtenstein, she had Jesper Jones, she had Warhol, and Yvonne was very impressed. And he said, okay, I can't do like Ileana. It's impossible, it's impossible, she's doing so well. So the response to pop art was conceptual and minimal art. So Yvon has been, has decided to open a gallery oriented to minimal and conceptual art. And not only he has been dealing with that, but he also, he also steals the assistant of Yelena Sonabunt, Mickey, who has been working with Yvon for 15 years. So that, that's how it starts. And at that time, as Yvon said, you know, to show conceptual and minimal art was a big challenge because he started with a small shop in left wing in Paris where basically hardly no one was coming. The first shows no one was buying. And once in a while, as I, you know, I was talking, sun, last Sunday I was with Ankawara who reminded me of that story. The first show on did at the gallery, suddenly Gunther Sachs came to the gallery and he bought the entire show. And on say it was absolutely unexpected. But you know there was a limited group of collectors, a limited group of curators, a limited group of galleries. It, it was a totally different time and that, that's how it starts. In, in some of the first shows that he did uh, from 
just to get some names, some, uh, some artists, could you mention some of those? Yeah, basically one of the very important and influential person he even met was Daniel Buren. Because with Daniel they had a very strong relation and one thing that that is not well known, but Yvon gave money on a monthly basis to Daniel to support his work, and in exchange, Daniel said, okay, I'll give you work. And you know, at that time, Yvon didn't have that much money, so it was a real commitment, and it gave Daniel the possibility to continue working. And Daniel and Yvon had decided to fly to New York, and then that's how they basically met with different group of artists. That's how even also met with Cy Twombly, who has been an extremely important part of the history of the gallery. And then they met Jasper Jones, also Rosenberg, Ryman, and Lawrence Wiener, and all this generation of artists. Daniel Bouvin is the, the most important example of the, uh, the French artist coming from the post-minimalist, conceptualist, Systemic. No? Exactly. Yeah. But you, th he was also showing uh, Calandre and, and other artists from land art and minimal art. No? I think we have some images, in fact. No? Some images of some historical shows. Maybe we can look at that. Uh, maybe you can tell us. Yes, here it's a show that was made in the 80s and it's a combination of Calandre sculpture, Breda, which is 14, meter, 14 meters long and styrofoam wall drawing by Solewit. Yvon has been working with Solewit since 1969. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Solewit, the American minim minimalist, no? Is also another important historian. That is a wall drawing by Solewit. Olivier, and... the perception of American minimalism in, in France in, in the beginning? The, the very good part is that minimal and conceptual art has been much more supported in Europe than it has been in America. When you can imagine that the first survey show of Lawrence Wiener that has ever been done in the United States was at the Whitney about four years ago. So you know it's very, whereas in, in Europe they have been Tons of, of survey show with Lawrence Wiener. So, you know, we have been lucky with Belgian collectors, Italian collectors, French collectors who have been extremely supportive of the work of conceptual and minimal artists. Great. It is interesting that still, I mean, talking about minimal and conceptual um, artists, it does remain a less uh, of course, extremely well recognized movement in art history, but less so in terms of the market. No, you rarely see uh, uh, conceptual and minimal works uh, in in the sort of evening auctions, but particularly the conceptual. No, no the you're, you're right. The, yeah. You're right. Even if in the past year it has changed a lot, where you can tell that some of these artists are making like quite some some big numbers at auctions but still it's rem it, it's not it will never be the same levels and a figurative painting in any way that that that's the, that the reality of of, uh, of the market for forever but but you know that that's a choice and that's a choice of a gallery not to go in that direction and and even has always been very 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 keen on supporting art that really reveals new practice and goes into more a radical way of, of, of dealing with art, yes. It, it's, often the, it's often the case, it seems to me, that a, a gallery, when it begins, and especially when it's uh, successful, it is associated with a certain generation of artists. And this is perhaps what you are mentioning here, the generation of minimal art, the artists related to minimalism and land art, no? Uh, how has the gallery managed to uh, follow other artists, other generations of artists through the 80s, through the 90s, and most recently? So through the 80s, Yvon, as you mentioned, was a little bit, you know, he has been in the 60s and the 70s into really minimal and conceptual, except Cy Twombly that he has followed forever, I mean, and, and then 
In the 80s, he even wanted to have fun. So suddenly, he has discovered all this generation of artists from Julian Schnabel to Robert Combas, who is a very French figurative artist. And they had so much fun for even it was absolutely great. And then in the, in the 90s, when I start working at the gallery, Yvon say, okay, we need to bring a new energy to the gallery. So that was how to bring a new generation of artists. And then we start working with Douglas Gordon, Jonathan Monk, David Trigley, and, and all these group of artists we have been working since then, you know. And that's was, that what, what was interesting is how you can relate them to an older generation of artists and how they can still continue having a conversation. You know, that's always what you're expecting when you're having all your artists at a big table, at a dinner, they have something to talk together. They're really sharing something together. And that's how you envision the thing when, you, when, you, when you're working in a gallery. Yeah, one interesting, actually, one interesting process is precisely when you have someone like yourself who, from a different generation joining in 93, you yeah. mentioned. No, you came into the gallery, so you've been working with them almost for 30, 20 years, so you bring new spirit, new energy. To the, to the program as well. That reflects quite strongly in the program. Uh, when did uh, Yvonne Lambert uh, retire from the gallery or, or withdrew from the gallery? So how was that and how is his relationship still with the with Officially, the Yvonne, you know, we, we had a gallery in New York for eight years. And then Yvonne at a certain point say, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I need to retire and not to, to deal with the gallery on a daily basis. And it was about two years ago. So we decided to close New York because I was mainly in New York. You were mainly. I was mainly in New York, so that's why. And we needed someone to be in Paris, so that that's how it works. And so we closed New York, which was of course difficult after eight years. And then I moved back to Paris. And so now Yvonne is mainly focusing on publishing books, which is also a very part, a very active part of the gallery since the very beginning, I would say. You do artist books, no? Of we course. do artist books, we do catalogs, we do catalog raisonné, and it's a very, very important. We publish about 20 to 30 books per year, which is a lot. And now the gallery is only in Paris. Yes. Tell me a little bit about the New York experience. How was that? Why, why did the gallery, why did you move there? What did you have in mind? So first, you know, that was a discussion we had with Yvonne. We wanted to open a project space with very specific project in New York. And that's what we did with a very small space on 25th Street. And then, you know, that's always the same thing. It comes from the artists, and the artists say, oh, project space is great, but Yvonne Lambert can't only do a project space. It has to be a gallery. So we stayed in that space for three years, and we had a 1,000 square meter space in Chelsea. And we did like a, a gallery, that's what we can do best anyway. And the experience was absolutely great because, you know, you, you really learn how to be professional in a totally different way than it can be in France. Because in France, it, can, it still remains very project-oriented, I would say. Whereas in America, you have to be extremely efficient. How does um, the market uh, how do you compare the market in, in Europe and the market in America? There's a gallery in Paris today uh, can live off the sales locally, or uh, how how is, uh, has it changed? It seems that in the past 10 years, there's new things coming up. There's the 20th uh, Hondisman, and there's uh, young galleries popping that are really... It seems there's a new energy, a new scene happening in Paris. Uh, there is a new scene, but there is a very new, strong scene, but still, you can't live from the local market. And, and that's the reality today. I don't, I don't see one Gary can survive from his local market. It, it's very complicated because the competition is getting stronger and stronger. An artist is now represented by several galleries in the world. And, and you know, that's always the same. It's what an artist at the end of the day is the key actors in what we all doing. Even if an artist decides to say, okay, sorry, I don't want to give you that work, what can we do? And that's a lesson we should all keep in mind is that, you know, they're really giving the rules 
And from that, we really have to understand how to react. And it's always a competition. They are mm -hmm. playing, they are taking advantage of situations, they're trying to make the most for them, and, and that, that's a reality. The gallery represents, co-represents many artists with American galleries and, and, and in, in Germany uh, and in England. How, how does this geopolitics of representation uh, work? Uh, how do you see that, that functioning as, as a Paris-based gallery? Are you the main, uh, can you remain the main gallery of many of those artists? Mm -hmm. Is it difficult? Or doesn't it depends, you know, it depends from one artist to another. For some, we are the main gallery. For some others, we are not the main gallery at all. And, and you know, what is interesting is that for artists to have three galleries or two galleries, it's also a different proposal every time. You know, for instance, that's always what Douglas Gordon is telling. The project that he's doing with Gagosian, which is in gallery in the US and in London, is different fr from the project we is doing with us. And you know, we have been working with him since 1996. And you know, the quality of the project is, is totally different, I think. And once in a while, we're doing a project all together, like we have been doing for the Zidane film, or at Art Unlimited in Basel, we're going to show a big project all together, based on Henry Hopper. So it, it, it really depends. And the artist knows how to use the most of every single galleries. Makes sense. And you, you uh, I, I, I was talking uh, to Lagos, uh, your director, and she told me that since you closed uh, New York, you also decided to invest quite uh, heavily on the participation in fairs around the world, no? So this is your first year in Sao Paulo. Can you tell me a little bit about your, your involvement in fairs? How many fairs are you doing now this year? Uh, we're doing nine fairs this year, which is quite a lot. Uh, and, and I think it's very important. It's becoming very, very important. That's interesting. One of the, one of the writers for the art newspaper in London called me and she's making an article and she was telling, do you think that galleries still need a space? when you see the booming of art fairs and also because you know there was someone in New York, a gallery in New York who tells her that they're doing over 70% of their incomes in art fairs, which is quite a lot, I think. And you know that, that I think it's, it's not that simple. Art fairs, it's a way to connect, it's also a way to promote. And for me what is interesting is art fairs, you see how mm, it's not only about selling, but it's also about curators. You know, there are curators you see on art fairs you will never see in a gallery, or a museum you will never see in a gallery space, which is quite surprising for me, you know, because I think there's nothing better than to see a solo show of an artist to have an idea of a practice. But if you, there's a, a nomadic um, behavior of collecting and, and creating that, that is affecting the way people buy and sell art, do you feel that... Um, for instance, being in Sao Paulo, I mean, this is quite, uh, quite quite of a novelty for all of us to have international galleries participating in this fair and bringing the, the uh, bringing the dialogue to to an international scope. Um, how how was it to I mean to, to be in Sao Paulo and how was it to how has it been? Yeah, uh, you know, I have did you manage to beat the system uh, in terms of taxes? How was all of that? Tax or that the, the taxes, I have right. to say, it has been not that bad at the end, you know, you always find a solution and, 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 and it works, you know. But what I've been very surprised is how people are eager to have a conversation, to ask questions. They are not afraid of, of asking and questioning and they want to have information and, and they're buying at the end, you know. And, and, you know, they are quite informed, I have to say, for artists. We brought Douglas Gordon, he was quite well known here. I'm, 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 I'm quite surprised in a very good way, you know, or Mario Testino is different, you know, people suddenly know him because he's super well known as a jet set and... You have a beautiful Brazilian photograph there. As exactly. Well, right? the so it helps. It helps. And from here, uh, what are the, some of the fairs that you're doing this year? You were in, I, I saw you in Mexico, you were just in New York. Yeah, we did, Fries, we did Mexico, Freeze New York, we, doing, we did Sao Paulo, next week we're doing Hong Kong. Then we're doing Basel, then we're doing Chicago, Freeze. 
You did a lot of them. I mean, you also have quite a large program. I mean, you have about how many artists do you have? We have 43 artists. 43 artists in the program, no? And usually you do one exhibition or two exhibitions? At the it depends the on the project of the artist, but we tend to do two shows at a time. Yeah. Two shows at a time. So you have 20 different shows that are running yeah, uh, per every year. three years yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 And this, uh, do you feel that uh, if you have many artists represented by other galleries as well, and you have the strong participation in the uh, in the fairs, and you're bringing mostly new work, I believe. No, you're not bringing so much historical works. No, fair. because because you know the thing is that people really expect from Lambert to bring historical work, but at the end, you know, as Yvon always says, the past is the past; it's done, and our role is to support. What's, what's going to be new. And for the artists, if you only capitalize on the past, it's not fair for them. Interesting, yeah. Interesting it's point. It's not fair for them. You know, that what they expect is to, you know, we could, for every fair, show the incredible soliloquy from the 70s. But what's the point? It's just to make money or just to, it's, it's not fair for the artist. So it really is a strategy just to bring very recent work exactly. and also to show, but of course exactly. you have your inventory of, of, course. of the 60s, of course. if you're approached. <laughs> but that, that it should be for museum only. I think. And one question, do you feel that doing as many fairs affects the, in some ways the pace of the program of, at the gallery? Of course. of course, you know, it's become very crazy in some kind of way because you know, even for the artists, now we, we try to be more restricted on the number of artists we're showing on every art fair, because you can't ask every single artist. That was that, well, my question. You the know, pressure I, on artists. I can't ask Jenny Holzer to have, on the nine fair to have a work. It's impossible. Or the quality of the work will get lower and lower. She can't produce that many work per year. It's impossible. So you have to say, okay, Jenny, we're going to show a new work in Basel, and that's it, you know, and or Douglas, you're going to do that, or Robert Barry, we're going to show that. You know, we, you have to be very strategic of what you're going to show and where you're going to show it. So you try to have different groups of yes. artists yes. at every fair? Yes, you so have there's to. There's not so much pressure? You have to. Yes. Otherwise, it's quiz every single artist and it's not good for them really because you can imagine if one gallery is doing that and they have three galleries what are they going to do you know and how do you see of course you mean you, you you usually come in for the fair and you stay two three days and then depending on the fair there's a you have a large team as well yeah. can you tell us a little bit about the, the operation so basically we have 20 people which is not that huge but you know we try to keep it as a family business, I would say. That, that is also very important for us, that when an artist is coming, he knows every single person at the gallery, that it doesn't become like a big company, but when it comes, and I can tell, you know, every single artist, they like to say hello to the archivist, to the person in charge of the press, to the liaison, that is, of the registrar, it's very important for us. So that's why we try to not getting too big. But still, there's a huge operation of shipping of course, all these of things. Course. That's a lot. That it's a lot, and 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 we are lucky to work with professional shipping company and to be able to to work with the best. You know, that's good. And what would you say, uh, since you've been following at least for 20 years quite closely the the market, no, the selling and buying of artworks? How do you see the the collecting scene changing? Do you see a different ki kind of collector coming up, maybe in the last five years? that have a different pace, a different uh, uh, interest, a different expectation about buying works? I mean, the, the, the thing is that it's, it's, it's what has changed, especially when you have been working with Yvon Lambert for so long, Yvon had an older generation of collector who was extremely educated, extremely informed, knowing what they were talking about, taking the time, making a lot of research. Today it goes faster, and I'm not telling that it's a little bit less educated, but I think it goes faster and it's more about consumption and buying and doing and without necessarily having the background. No. And, and I don't know if it's good or bad, that's the reality. 
do you feel that um, I think we see uh, we live in a moment where this conglomerate uh, galleries or, or sort of um, super galleries start to uh, create new strategies to the market of uh, fostering or putting out or press putting prices and controlling market do you feel that that perhaps also has uh, affected the way people collect um, uh, perhaps that the what we could call the uh, the Damien Hirst effect or the spectacle effect of the 90s of the YPA and the yes of course it affects because you know now a lot of a new generation of collectors when they're buying they're thinking of investment because you know when you know that in six months time what you're buying can be twice the price you bought it when you resell it it's totally changed your way of thinking you know and you say okay why could I not make money out of it? Why well, you see that if I buy a work 20, I can resell it 40. And that's a new thing in the market. It's, it's, not, it's something, it's is, is that a new, recent thing? It's not a new, new thing. In the, in the 80s, it already existed. But at that level, I think it's, uh, it's quite scary in some kind of way. In the 80s, I think it wasn't as intense, no? I think there was, it was all, it was very new. But I think now, from what I've read, I didn't follow the 80s, but I mean, from what I read, it seems that it has multiplied like several times over, exponentially over. Yes, and it and it's all over the world. That's a big difference, you know. It's not it's not, and the information, it's widespread so much faster that it's totally different, you know. And 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 the markets, you can see now, many galleries they are not working anymore like galleries. They are working like big industry. But it's fine, and it's, uh, it's fine. Would you say participating in these nine different fairs, and I would say, uh, um, you said you, you don't know if it's good or bad to have that type of collecting, I would say that it's not so interesting from my perspective. I, would, I am more interested, you know, informed, of course, uh, consumer about be it a collector or a viewer. Would you say that uh, this type of collecting is more prevalent in certain fairs rather than others, or certain, or coming from certain countries, or certain regions? Do you see that stronger maybe in Asia, than in Europe, than in, in Miami, or New York, or Latin America? Do you have any views that you would like to share with us on that? It, it, it would be a little bit, I mean, it, it's always difficult to, to make it shorten, yeah. and you know, in some kind of way. <laughs> I, I, I totally understand. I would say that in Basel, it's a more tradi traditional way of collecting and thinking. And I, I still think of Basel, it's, it's an extremely well sophisticated and extremely refined uh, art fairs, you know, where people are super well educated, uh, they know, they take time still. Some other fairs, it's like yes, it, it could be it could be like a big shopping mall. It would not make any difference, but but that's fine. And you know, it's uh, I think I think us we just have to understand how it's it's always the same. It's how we can make the artists we feel that are important for one reason to another to make them stronger. And you know, at the end, it's how to reveal a practice that can slightly change the rules. And that is it's how you can take advantage of a situation just to make that. It seems to me that, in fact, it becomes quite challenging for the artist, him or herself, in order not to fall prey to, that, to a certain easy system of just producing works and feeding this whole system, no? Would you see that as a challenge? I mean, some artists have to resist this type of temptation, I would say. Yeah, but I would say it, it's so different from one artist to another because they have different capacity to, to resist. Some, they are extremely brilliant to play with the system and to use the system and to know how to, how to give and to release work at the right moment. Some others, you, the gallery needs to tell them how to do otherwise you know they can easily be killed by the system that's a reality as well so you know it, there's no general rules it really depends from one artist to another yeah.
tell us a little bit about the museum, you know, the Ebola Bears, uh, founded in the south of France. So basically, since ever, Yvon has been collecting in depth, and it has been extremely important for him. And he put really an incredible numbers of works together, and especially from the 60s and the 70s, where he's probably as the most important body of work in private hands by Sai Tuong Li, Carl Andre, Sol Lewitt, Lawrence Wiener, Agnes Martin, Robert Ryman, Donald Judd. And it's not only the work, but it's all the archives. And, and it continues up to now. And Yvon has this wanted one thing, is that all these works to be, to be all together at some point. So he has decided to give them to the French state. But he was asking, he has required from the French state to open a museum and not a foundation. So the French state opened a public museum, which is called Collection Lambert, Museum of Contemporary Art, is in Avignon. And in 2014, it will be a museum of 6,000 square meters with a collection and three temporary exhibitions per year. Um, one question before we ask. Uh, we open for questions if every, anyone else has them. Uh, in, participate, in participating in many fairs around the world, do you also find it uh, interesting to have artists that are from that uh, locale or from that region in order to establish a connection with, with the cl collectors or the clients or the curators there? How does that work? Do you uh, uh, do research also, maybe pick up some other artists or do exchange with galleries, for example? To be, to be Totally honest, we never think of a nationality of an artist. The first thing is the practice. If you see a practice that is absolutely fantastic, you go, is this artist is from Brazil? Good. If I'm from France, good. He's from Egypt, good. We never question, okay, we should have an Asian artist because now the Asian market is blowing. I don't care. But wouldn't, wouldn't you think the opposite? If, if I have an Asian art, artist, maybe if I have an Indian artist, it becomes interesting to participate in a fair in Delhi, or, or, yeah, or do you go to Delhi or Hong Kong with all your... Yes uh, and European no, because, because if as a French gallery, I'm representing a Brazilian artist and I'm participating to the, to the Sao Paulo Art Fair, what's the point to show this Brazilian artist who probably has already a Brazilian gallery? I don't see the point at all. Gal galleries often say that that's a way of connecting with someone. If you have one artist from that region or from that locale, or that is a way... It facilitates, but I don't think that's the way it is. I think it's extremely more challenging and extremely more ambitious if I come here with artists who are not represented in Brazil and to show practice that is not familiar to all of you. That, that I think I envision the role of a gallery was the Mario Testino Brazilian photograph, for example, or connection somehow. <laughs> yes, it was, it, was, it was related to it. It's, he made a series of photos in Brazil. and, and 90, right? Yes, exactly. So that, that was the connection. That exactly. the connection, yeah, yeah. Um, if, any other questions? Um, Pedro, anyone? That's open to, to the public, maybe. Let's just go through the rest of the images then we haven't, we haven't seen. This is... So what you see here, it's mainly all the historical artists that Yvon has been working since the 60s. Sorry, it's an early show of Giulio Paolini, who is an Italian artist more related to Arte Povera. It's still Giulio Paolini in the, the very first gallery of Yvon in the 6th arrondissement. Giulio. Giulio, we have a lot of Paolini. Julio. This is a gallery in the, from the 60s. The show is a history. This one, this one is, a, is a gallery we are currently in the third. So, okay. so you've been there for how long? Uh, since 1986. All right. Yeah. Yeah. This is Niel Toroni, who belongs to that group of Buren, Mosse, Parmentier, and Toroni, BMPT. That was a show that was curated by an artist, Patrick Corillon, who is French, but is mainly interesting in literature. And you can, and, and it was based on art and literature. And there was uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, even was the only one in France who did 
two shows with Jean-Michel Basquiat when he was alive. And yeah. that was our first show with Anselm Kiefer in 1991. One question. Uh, do you, uh, how do you see co-representing Anselm Kiefer, for instance, uh, with, a, with a, a gallery from the same from the same region, from the same city. Working with Kiefer, White Cube. I don't see, I don't see, you know, it's, it's very old. For instance, Laurence Wiener has been working with uh, many galleries in Italy or e even in New York. He was working at the same time with Leo Castelli and Marianne Goodman. Once he was doing a show with uh, Marianne, the other time he was doing a show with Leo Castelli. I don't see that as a problem because I think what you deliver to a gallery is also an exchange and the dialogue you're having with the gallery. And you see in New York more and more it happens with a, a younger gallery who is representing an artist and a more established. And it's fine, I think, because the proposals are, are totally different or can be different. And being reaching for the artist exactly. and, and different contexts exactly. for display the work. Can we see some of the image Kiefer? And that's still Kiefer, that's a show from 1997. Lawrence Wiener with the first piece we ever did with him since it was in 1971. Sol Lewitt. Yeah. That's a, a show we did on books. It's, it's a, because since 1992 we're doing books which are a discussion between an artist and a writer or a scientist or whoever wants the artist wants to work with. Most of the time it's books that are taking over three years to be published. So this year, for instance, we're publishing Philippe Pareno, Douglas Gordon, Rikriti Ravanija, Annette Messager. Yeah, we're doing quite a lot, yeah. Ankawara, that was a show we did in the 80s where we show over 30 years of that painting, yeah, at the end of the 80s, early 90s, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank Olivia. you to you. Thank you, Pedro, as well. Thank, thank you. you all. And I'll see you in a little bit. We have another uh, dialogue now with Thomas Kong. Thank you. Thank you.